the songs we were singing, and the, the Holy Spirit spoke, spoke a word to me, and I, I struggled with it because it seemed contradictory to what we were singing. And sometimes I feel that way about a, some, several songs that we sing, not just here, but the body of Christ is singing, about whether how biblically accurate they are. And so I didn't know what to do, so I submitted the word to uh, Bishop-elect Yates, and he released me to share it with you. And we were in that song where it says, pour it out, pour it out. And I heard the Lord say, you say, pour it out, and I say, let it flow. You say, pour it out, and I say, let it flow. You say, God can do it again. I say, I have already done it. Have I not said in my word that of his fullness have you all received and grace upon grace? Have I not said that out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water? And as that flows from your belly and your belly and your belly and your belly, so those rivers shall merge together into one mighty torrent that will fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And so, church, the Lord says to you, arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Will you arise? Will you let it flow? Will you let it flow? I say, will you let it flow? Tell the Lord you'll let it flow. And I felt the Holy Spirit said to me, in that which you ask for revival, you're looking for fire, you're looking for wind, for rain. But the Lord says, I have already deposited revival within you. Let it out. Release the fire. Let the river flow. Breathe the wind of the Holy Spirit into the dead bones of this earth, and they shall live, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's give him praise. Demita. 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 I had a word last night, and uh, but I couldn't get clear who it was for. And this morning, I, as I was praying and thinking about the service, the Lord said it was for you. And it was just mainly to remind you, first of all, of the scripture in Psalm 37 that says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Trust in the Lord. Delight yourself in him, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And then I saw something strange. I, I don't, I've never been to your home. I don't know what your house looks like. I don't even know if you have a front yard. But I saw this beautiful tree that had been newly planted in your front yard. And the scripture came to me from Proverbs 13, 12 that says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. And so I saw the Lord, this tree in your front yard, to remind you and to give you a vivid illustration of the fact that the desire is coming. He will give you the desires of your heart. And I, and I said, Lord, do you want me to take the, take the meat aside and share that with her? And the Lord said, no, my people need to be reminded of this, to be reminded of this. And I want you to know that hope may be deferred. Sometimes it looks like you're chasing the impossible dream. But if God has promised it, he will do it. No word of God lacks power. He shall perform what he has promised in your life. Do not let that promise go. And if you have received that promise through a prophetic word, wage a good warfare with that prophecy that's been spoken over you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God bless you, Demita. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I don't know, something, something about you get on this platform that just turns you loose. I don't know. Can I have a little more light? I can't see 
too many faces this morning. Whoever controls the lights, could I have a few more, please? I'm waiting. Now, I got a lot of light in my face, but, ah, there you are. I just have this thing about talking to real faces I can see, you know. I don't, I don't do good talking to cameras or that, that kind of thing. I get tongue-tied. Can you believe it? Our message today concerns, it actually is uh, part of the Kingdom Matters series, and it's, uh, uh, Bishop Elect Jay said you could call it Heaven Number 3, and uh, I want to speak to you this morning about the mystery of marriage. And my prayer is not, uh, we are coming up with a, a marriage seminar in a couple of weeks, two, uh, two to win, and uh, I hope you're planning to be part of that. Every marriage couple should at least once every year invest in their marriage through some kind of a retreat or seminar or workshop. Now, come on, this is an old man of 57 years telling you that, 57 years of marriage. So you need to make that investment. So I hope you're planning to be part of that. And although this message will speak to earthly marriage, we want to focus this morning on a very special event. Heaven is its venue. It's where Jesus the bride and the church the bridegroom are going to come together in marriage and enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17 to 33. I'll be referring to this passage throughout my message. And uh, Are we supposed to have some scripture here? Okay, we got, we're trying something new here, and my timer's still not working, but back there they've already taken four minutes off my sermon time. <laughs> I preached at a church in Washington one time, and they took this great big round wall clock and stuck it right there on the front seat. So I would look at that, and it's, they put 30 minutes on it, and it starts ticking down as soon as you get up. Boy, that's some kind of pressure, I tell you. <laughs> another, another friend of mine, uh, an evangelist, he went to a church and they said, now we start at 11, at 12, 11.30, we turn the service over to you and we have to be done by 12. And he said, but if the Holy Spirit really moves, take five minutes more. Wow. So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 13, or 17 to 33. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever lived life on your own terms? You've done it, you've tried it your way. Let me ask you another question. How did that go for you? Well, let me ask you another question. How many of you have learned that God's way is a better way? That God's way is healthier, happier, and will bring more success to your life? And knowing the will of God means to know and understand how to do it His way. Sometimes our will and His will come into clash, but if we will have the attitude of Jesus and say, not my will, but your will, and we'll walk out His will, we'll have the best possible life. Somebody that was talking to to an uh, atheist said, you know, what I've got is the best thing. If if you come to the end of your life and, and there's nothing there, uh, you're, you're, just, you're just dead like a dog in the ground. If I come to the end of my life and, and, and I've been correct, uh, I've got a whole wonderful eternity ahead of me, but if I come to the end of my life and find that this was all bogus, I still have will lived the best possible life I could have lived. He goes on in verse 18, And do not be drunk with wine and which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Verse 22, wives to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body, therefore, Just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, 
just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And verse 32 is a verse I want you to really focus on. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The word mystery is used several times uh, throughout the New Testament uh, in, in a variety of ways. Uh, it can also mean a secret. You know, some people just don't know how to deal with a secret. I, I don't know why these jokes put the, put the burden on women, but one woman was talking to another, and she's telling her a lot of things, and the other woman says, tell me more, tell me more. And the first woman says, I've already told you more than I heard. <laughs> Some people think a secret is something you only tell one person at a time. Benjamin Franklin, who wrote a publication called Poor Richard's Almanac, uh, made this comment. He said, two people can keep a secret as long as one of them is dead. But we have these mysteries or secrets in the New Testament. Uh, in 1 Timothy, we have one called the mystery of godliness. But you see, it's no longer a mystery hidden or concealed, but now it's a secret revealed. And the revelation of the mystery of godliness is this. God was manifested in the flesh. There is what's called the mystery of his will. And that's in Ephesians 1.9 that, that the Gentiles would be included in God's plan of salvation along with Jews. There is the mystery of the riches of his glory. And this is the revelation of the riches of his glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then there is the mystery that we read about here in Ephesians chapter 5, the mystery concerning Christ and his church. This Greek word musterion, translated mystery, means uh, something which is... Uh, concealed, it's hidden, it's unknown before, but you have to understand it through revelation or by, by being instructed into it. People who are, do not know the Lord, people who cannot discern things by the Spirit, would not understand what Paul is speaking about here. That's why it's so difficult for, for, for marriage to work when, it's, uh, uh, when marriage is entered into by uh, people who don't know the Lord or one knows the Lord and mistakenly marries one who's outside the Lord because they don't understand that, uh, how marriage should be perceived spiritually. But these secrets have all been revealed to us. Paul says, don't, don't be without understanding. Now you can come to a knowledge of his will, praise the Lord. Paul is not using marriage here in this chapter, I believe, as a uh, as just an illustration of the church, well, if you look at human marriage, then you understand something about Jesus and the church. No, he's saying if you understand something about Jesus and the church, then you'll understand how marriage on earth is supposed to work. So a successful marriage on earth begins with a revelation, knowledge, and understanding of how Jesus relates to his church. We know from Scripture that Jesus is the bridegroom. He taught his disciples that he was going to go away but they would not be without help or comfort. He would not leave them as orphans, but he would send the Holy Spirit to be with them and to be in them and would be, and would be within the people of his, of his church throughout the, the ages until that time came when he would return again to the earth himself. The Holy Spirit has been sent to be in us everything that Jesus would be to us if he was with us physically here in his flesh. People say, oh, it would be so thrilling to have Jesus walk in the room. Well, I, I have to tell you, the truth of the Scripture is he's in the room. And he didn't walk up the aisle. He came in with you. 
If you know the Lord Jesus and you're indwelt by His Spirit, you brought Him His presence here this morning. Jesus told the disciples when He was going to go away, you know, it distressed them that, to think about that. And, and He said, don't let your hearts be troubled about that in John 14. Trust in the Lord. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Praise God. Where you, you will always be with me where I am. In Acts chapter 1, 10, 11, the, Jesus has just ascended into heaven and the disciples are just in awestruck about that whole thing and they're just standing there gazing into heaven and uh, two men in white robes appear. Now those that you're studying catalysts are about angels, you know. Masculine, no wings. Two men in white robes are standing there, and, and they say to them, you, say, you men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into the heavens? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. That's called our, our blessed hope. John the baptizer first introduced the idea of Jesus as a, a bridegroom when he, uh, uh, that would be taken away and that would return. And one day his disciples came to him to complain uh, about how all of those who that had been with them were leaving them and going over and following Jesus. And John replied to him this way in John 3, 28 to 30, you yourselves know how plainly I told you. I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride. And the best man is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. So John introduces himself as the friend of the bridegroom, or uh, as the NLT says, the, the best man. But Jesus is identified as the bridegroom who gets the bride. In Matthew 9.15, Jesus first introduces the idea of himself as a bridegroom. The disciples of Jesus come, or uh, the Pharisees come to Jesus, and they say, why don't your disciples fast? You know, they're supposed to fast. Why, why aren't they fasting? And this is Jesus, how Jesus answered them. He said, do guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. To help, Jesus, help his disciples understand the, the nature of their relationship with him, Jesus told them about uh, ten virgins, you remember? Five that were foolish and five that were wise. Five that were prepared and five that worked. And, and five had oil in their lamps. Uh, five had let the oil run out. And uh, the cry went out, the bridegroom is coming. And uh, the five foolish virgins said to the others, give us some of your oil so that we'll have some. And they said, no, that, that's not possible. We can't do that. And so the bridegroom came and, and went in with, with the five that were prepared. And this is what Jesus said about that. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. And so Jesus presents these pictures of, of himself as, as a bridegroom. And then the church is the bride. Perhaps no scripture is clearer about this than 2 Corinthians 11, 2, where Paul says this, for I am jealous of you, with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. And so Paul clearly sees and identifies that, that God's people, the church, are, are the bride, a bride that, that he had promised to Jesus. To, uh, the King James Version says, I believe, to present him with a chaste virgin. Revelation 21, 1 and 2 says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And in Revelation 21, 9 it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And so we know that the bridegroom is in heaven. The bridegroom is in heaven. He went away. He was, he was taken up. Acts chapter 3, verse 20 says that the heavens received Jesus 
but that word means welcomed him. The heavens welcomed him. And that welcome is staying good. They're holding him back until something happens when he can come again. And what happens is it says the restoration of all things spoken out of the mouths of the prophets since time began. And when those things happen, then the heavens will release Jesus. I believe he's eager to come. I believe when he descends with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, that the reason he's going to shout is because it's going to be, hallelujah, I get the bride. I remember early on in my relationship with Marguerite, we were, we were just teenagers and uh, just hadn't known each other very long, but I wrote her dad a note and go right to the bride's father, right? And I, and I, and I said, I, I know we're young and we hardly have a relationship, but I believe someday I'm going to marry your daughter. And he was gracious about it. He wrote back to me. I was at school and, and he said, uh, well, you know, if, if, that's, if that's the will of God, it'll happen. And he had that attitude towards it. And then there came a point where she tried to tell me to take a hike. <laughs> and, and she said, I, I just wanted to see what it was like to go out with somebody older. Yeah, I was two years older. An old college man of 18. And so she tried to tell me to take a hike. And I thought about that. And I thought, no, I'm not going. And you know, there came a time two years later when I got the bride. I got the bride. And we got married on a Saturday, and the next Sunday, next day in church, I stood up in that congregation, and I said, I got the bride. <laughs> and I believe Jesus is so anxious for him to come. Somebody said the reason Jesus hasn't come yet is because there's not enough messianic hunger in the earth. Our desire for him. It says that he's going to come to be admired in his saints. It's going to be so wonderful. We don't know what he's going to be like, but we're going to, what we're going to be like, but we're going to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so Jesus is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. Heaven is the venue. I, I really like weddings. I like my own, and I like those that I get to be part of. I had the opportunity to be part of probably more than 150 weddings. And uh, I, I just, you can take all, please, understand me what my heart is. Give the funerals to somebody else, but I'll take all the weddings I can get. The weddings and baby dedications, I, I, love, I love that part of it. I got to do my uh, niece's wedding here a while back, and their, their venue was to be the, the state park uh, down in Sebring, but it was just, the area was just devastated by the hurricane. And the area, a little chapel back in, back clearing and back in the woods uh, with a cross and built-in seats where they were going to have it was just a, uh, it was just a pile of debris. It was just a mess. And I remember that they communicated with me about this. I said, what are we, what are we going to do? And uh, what are we going to do for a venue for our wedding? And it, it worked out that they were able to get it cleaned out and we could have it back in that beautiful place. But can you imagine what a venue heaven is going to be for the greatest wedding of history? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I think the decor is going to include a cross because it's called the marriage of the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. After the return of Christ to receive his bride, she is seen in heaven. Revelation 19, 6 to 9 says, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I tell you, when I saw my wife coming down the aisle in that beautiful dress that her mom just finished as she was walking out the door. The latch stitch was going in as they got ready to get in the car. I, I, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven in that moment. 
She was arrayed in this beautiful white. And can you imagine the atmosphere in heaven that's being described here? As the bride of Christ is clothed in beautiful white linen called the righteousness of the saints. And there is such a celebratory thing happening. The whole cry that's going up there from that great multitude that is so loud and so thunderous that it sounds like many waters and and storms, saying, Alleluia, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Wow. Wow. You see, God's plan of salvation will only be complete when the Lord Jesus comes again to gather his bride and take her to heaven for the wedding. And there we will be brought into union with all of those from the beginning of time who have been redeemed. What an experience. I don't want to miss it. How about you? If you're there this morning, you don't know the name of Jesus. If you've never called upon the name of the Lord for salvation, if you've never repented of your sins and your own righteousness and accepted the grace that's offered to him through you, You don't want to miss out on this experience. We'll give you opportunity to deal with that in a few moments. In the Ephesians 5 passage, there's three very important principles concerning Christ's relationship with his church that I I believe carry into our understanding of how our marriages should be. And if you're you're younger, and I I don't care how young you are, when I was a boy, I believed that someday I would be married and have a family. I I believed that from the time I was a boy. That, That was desirable. To me. I wanted that to be one of the goals of my life. When I was a junior in high school, we wrote down how we saw our lives in five years. I wrote in there, I said, I'll be married, I'll have two kids, a dog, and a parakeet. <laughs> so even if you're a young person, but, but you believe that, that God has plans for, your marriage, for marriage in your future, that he's going to bring you a special someone to share the rest of your life with, then you need to get a hold of this. Ephesians 5.24 says, as the church, oh, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as, in the same way, in the same way that Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. The church came into being because of the sacrificial love of God. According to Ephesians 2, humanity was dead in trespasses and sins. We walked according to this course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Uh, The whole world was under the influence of the wicked one, but there was something greater than all of that, and that was a great God who loved humanity. For God so loved, we read. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. We know what real love is, John tells us, because Jesus gave up his life for us. Paul says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, I I, I see that cross high and, and lifted up because everything that's happening there is because of the cross. It's because of the blood. The the church, the bride of Christ, was purchased at a great price. She was redeemed out of trespasses and sins. She was redeemed out of the condemnation of the law. She was delivered out of the hands of the wicked one by the precious blood of of Jesus who purchased her for himself. In 1 Peter, verse 2 and verse 9, he says, you you know this scripture says that uh, King James said you are you are a peculiar people. We read that, we think, yeah, I'm a little odd, you know. I'm a little peculiar. That's not really what that means. What that, what that means is something that is expensive, something that is purchased at a great price. And so we are a purchased possession. And Jesus purchased us at the cost of his own life for us so that we could be part of his bride. You know, couples going into marriage tend to focus uh, on being in love. Have you ever said or heard people talk about falling in love? Every time I hear that, I think of somebody walking down the road and stepping into a pothole. Uh, what happened? I just fell in. You know, I wasn't planning to. You know, I just, all of a sudden I looked across the, somewhere across a crowded room, 
and, and her eyes met mine, and wow, I just fell in love in that moment. It seems in our society that if you fall, can fall in love, you can fall out of love. And a lot of marriage cer- ceremonies have been changed now to take out till death do we part, and they've inserted till love as long as we love. As long as we love. Not as long as we live, but as long as we love. And so if I quit loving you, then I have a reason to, to dump you. But think about the potential that you consider marriage, even young people, considering it now before the event. And those of us that are already married, of of going into a relationship, counting the cost, understanding that this relationship, to have this bride, to have this marriage, is going to cost my life. I'm going to have to lay down my life every day for this marriage. I'm going to have to lay down my life every day to experience the the fulfillment of what God has for me. There's a price to pay, and love costs. Love sacrifices. The measure of love is sacrifice. If you you want to take take away something this morning, take away that. The sacrifice is the measure of love. Not only love, but marriage only works through loving submission and obedience. Ephesians 5.24 says, as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands and everything. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. He said his nourishment was to do the will of the one who had sent him. He said, uh, uh, Lord, you, you, you have, I, I came to do your will, O God. Nevertheless, not my will, but your be done. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. Jesus is coming for a prepared bride. A bride who has made herself ready. A bride who has learned the blessing of submission and obedience to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. How many of you know our flesh rebels at the idea of submission? We don't like that word because many of us have known people that abused their authority. We've known people that were ex-spouses who were heavy-handed or maybe even a current spouse. We've known employers who were heavy-handed. We've known spiritual leaders that we're domineering and controlling and heavy-handed, and, and we shrink back at this whole idea. I, I, know, I know wives who simply cannot get past Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. They cannot get past this statement, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. But listen, I want you to know, ladies, that before verse 22 comes verse 21, and verse 21 says to all of us, Submitting yourselves to one another. Submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. In Christ, we are brought into relationship with a, with a kind, gentle, loving, self-sacrificing Savior who desires only the best for us in this life and in the life to come. It's easy to submit to Jesus because I know that he will never do anything for my, my bad. He'll never hurt me. He's for me. He's not against me. He's not disappointed in me. He's not disillusioned with me. If he can be disillusioned with me, he had illusions to start with, and God can't be deceived. So when he got me, he knew absolutely what he was getting. And when he got you, he knew what he was getting too. And so when... When we have a master who wants only our best, who loves us, who cares for us, who sacrificed for us, it's easy to submit ourselves to someone like him. And what if we were all like that? What if we who are the bride of Christ were like our bridegroom? What if we are being perfected and changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God to become people that are kind, gentle, and self-sacrificing? That having been said, that being established, submitting to one another, what wife would fear to submit herself to a husband like that? What children would be hesitant to obey parents who they knew and were convinced loved them and sacrificed for them and wanted only the best for them? Why would we be afraid to follow a leader, a pastor, 
who, who evidences to us that he lays down his life for us, that he gives up his life for the flock, for the flock of God, that, that he's not a wolf that flees. I mean, he's not, he's not a false shepherd that flees when the wolf comes, but he's a good shepherd to the sheep. Why would we, why would we be afraid of that? Why would we not rather make it joyful? Because he oversees and watches out for our souls. There's a lot of conflict that would be avoided in marriage. If both parties entered that relationship or both parties in that relationship would begin to live with a commitment to truly honor and serve one another, just as Jesus does, does the church. To love and serve one another. To not be highly opinionated. In honor, preferring one another. And that, that's the kind of environment the church is supposed to be. And when it's like that, submission and obedience is not difficult. It's easy. We understand that it's for our blessing. Third thing is that marriage only works through holiness. In Ephesians 5, 25 to 26, it says he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Throughout his lifetime, Jesus faced real temptations. In Hebrews 4, 15, it says, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the Scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. When we came to Christ, we were cleansed from our sin. Aren't you glad? Yes. Pastor Steve... Bishop elect Steve, we hear him so often, stands here, and, 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 and he says, from the time I was born until this moment, all of these things are going to be washed away. And I tell you, I can remember when that happened to me, all of those from day one to almost 19 years old, I, I, re, I remember how I felt when I came to the understanding that I had been cleansed, that all my sins had been washed away. Oh, praise the Lord. I, 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 it's been a long time ago. I'll never forget it. So we have been washed. We've been cleansed. They were all washed away. Baptism is the representation, and we're going to see a number of people get baptized in the Lord this morning. But baptism is the rep representation of that cleansing. We were declared holy before God. Positionally before God, we were declared to be saints. Amen. A saint is not something that's canonized by the church years after their death. A saint is someone who, who is made, declared holy by the blood of Jesus Christ yes. because they are made the righteousness of God in him. So St. Janita, it's a blessing to be with you this morning, St. Rene, you know, St. Demetrius, St. Rocky. Why is everybody laughing? <laughs> we took on that new status. But holiness or, or sanctification is not only positional. It's practical. It's not only positional, it's progressive. Because we have to live out that holiness on this earth. We have to live out that experience day to day. According to the Bible, we must flee youthful lusts. We must flee sexual immorality. We must flee from idolatry. We must flee from greed and the love of money. We are to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord and pursue peace and holiness without which no man shall see God. Listen to me. Don't be discouraged about your progress. Just keep moving. You're not alone in the struggle. Jesus has committed himself to the process. He has submitted, sent his Holy Spirit into your life to, to, to transform you into the image of the bridegroom, to change you from step to step, from one level of glory into another. When you came together this morning, you should leave this house having moved up a step. He has committed himself to the process of, of, of making us a finished work, of presenting us, as Paul says, to present us blameless before the throne of his glory. And so that positional holiness becomes worked out as practical holiness as we live out our Christian life with the Lord. 
As we continue to walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus, his son, is cleansing us from all unrighteousness. By his spirit, he, he continues to wash us with the water of his word to cleanse us. Listen, I want to say to you husbands, how many husbands are here this morning? Now, come on, Pastor, Pastor I keep, I'm sorry, Bishop Philip Gates says that this is how you say, how you lift your hand. That, that, that's all, we only have about 10 husbands here this morning? Wow. Let's try it one more time. How many husbands are here this morning? All right, that's better. Some of you ashamed to admit it or what? <laughs> but I would say to you that if you will wash your wife with the word every day. If you'll speak the word to her, speak the word over her, pray with her, pray the word over her, your bride will become more and more radiant. She'll, you, you, so I've, uh, sometimes you hear people say, uh, well, she is not the same person I married. My wife says I'm not the same man she married. I'm twice the man she married. That's a bit discouraging. But you have to understand, I was very skinny when I got married. I want, to, I want you to, I, I believe this, that in marriage there is no deeper level of intimacy than when a man and his wife pray together. That is the deepest level of intimacy. And so if you have not moved into that level of intimacy yet, I covet that for you in your marriage. Men, your wives need to not just know that you pray for them. They need to hear you pray for them. Well, but I'm not good at praying out loud. Stumble through it, baby. She'll love you all the more. She'll love you all the more. When my wife and I would get down on our knees beside the bed at night and we'd pray for each other, I'll tell you, that healed a lot of things. That brought us so close. No, there, wasn't, there wasn't room for a sheet of paper to slide in there, I'll tell you. So how do you grow in holiness? Spend a lot of time in intimacy with the Holy Spirit. It's not, there's a reason he's called the Holy Spirit. And you spend a lot of time fellowshipping with the Spirit of God, and you'll be convicted of anything in your life that isn't holy. Believe me, the Holy Spirit is real eager to put his finger on anything in our life that's not glorifying to the Lord. You don't have to search your, out your own stuff. You don't have to go into some sort of introspection. You just have to trust the Holy Spirit. He'll reveal it if you'll accept it and repent of it. And that's the second thing. Not only spend a lot of time in intimacy with the Holy Spirit, but be quick to repent. When you're convicted of sin, be quick to repent. The longer you wait, the more difficult it will become. The longer you wait, the more likely that you'll begin to sear your conscience, that you'll begin to harden your heart. Don't let it, keep your heart soft. Repent quickly when you sin. And thirdly, as Paul instructs us in Galatians, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, and all that that means, that's another whole message, but walk in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit that dimension of the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Praise the Lord.